Good morning. Uh, let me first of all thank all of you for being here. We had an overwhelming response to this conclave. And last evening, Arsana Das, who was the head of the SN Foundation, she called me up saying that I am closing registrations because we may not be able to accommodate people. So I would like to thank the SN team. <laughs> Arsana, Jivita, um, and Shivani. Uh, I would like to thank the sponsors, uh, the speakers, Rajiv Bajaj, who is going to be the, our keynote speaker after me. Uh, he has been unwell for the last two, three days, and he, is, he was in touch with me, saying that I hope I can get well. And in spite of his health, uh, he's taken the trouble of coming all the way from Pune to here. So thank you, Rajiv. We are all looking forward to your address uh, very eagerly. I would also like to thank the sponsors. So my, my topic is my personal mantras, which could be relevant for, for entrepreneurs. I, before I start that, I just want to give a flavor of Ascent that this was started about six years back. We have about 400 members and our dream is to actually be much, much bigger. We want to cover all India. Uh, we want to, today there are about 380 members in Bombay. We want to take it to 1,000 members. And it is getting a very good feedback from all the members. We have very good satisfaction scores. And I would urge those who are present here who are not members, to join Ascent. If you know anybody else who is uh, wanting to um, join Ascent, please talk to your friends because we would want to get more and more members to be a part of this journey. So who is an entrepreneur? Entrepreneur is a person who wants to leave a footprint in society. He wants to transform lives. He wants to create meaning. He is so focused on the meaning that nothing phases him not the mundane rigor of getting the idea of the drawing board into the marketplace. The only thing that drives him is the goal, and the goal lays the road he makes. An entrepreneur is someone who invented the phrase, I can. I'll now move on to my own journey. I started at a very young age, did my graduation from Bombay. At the age of 20, I joined the family business. I couldn't get admission into a management school, not that bright. So my father asked me to join the business. I wanted to go abroad, he said no. And that's how I joined the family business, a joint family business. Um, my father was the eldest. I was the first grandchild, eldest grandchild, male grandchild. And I used to live with my grandparents, my uncles, um, my parents. A large family, about almost 25 of us, staying in the same building, same kitchen. So staying my formative years, about almost for 20, 25 years, we stayed together. And I think that taught me a lot of things. Uh, staying in joint family exposed me to different interests, different family members had. My parents used to play golf. One of my uncles was a very good rider. One of them a very good sailor, interested in music, gardening. So my life was actually exposed to a lot of different things. And as a part of the joint family, we used to have meals together. Um, and that taught me values of being together was unity, camaraderie, tolerance. Uh, even things like frugality, we used to go in one car to office every day in the morning and come back together. So I think that was my formative years as a joint business. And when I joined the business, it was a completely family-managed organization. Nobody to train me, nobody to guide me. And my father just let me loose, saying that you do whatever you want to do, just explore, visit different businesses. And in that exploration, I chanced upon uh, the consumer products part of the business. So many times, you know, I read that entrepreneurs need to have a very clear vision of what they want to do. My view is quite the opposite. I didn't have any clue when I joined the business what I wanted to do. And as I started concentrating on consumer products, I realized that yes, this was definitely my calling. But from edible oils, we went to other personal care products, uh, foods, and then we went into services in Kaya. 
so my first learning was that this vision part you know it evolves it you don't have a clear vision when you start your business as the business environment changes you get newer opportunities and there is a negative in very tightly defined vision because many times you may get certain opportunities which you would miss out on if you have a very very close tightly held vision so my my first mantra is that let the vision get evolved and keep it a little flexible because many times you'll get opportunities which may be beyond what you have defined the vision and you should of course pursue these opportunities and that's what i've done um, over a period of time of late i have just started a new business in in healthcare which is um, a rehab center for recovery from different injuries i never thought i would do all this i never thought i would start something like kaya when i started marico or when i started consume products but something happened somebody came into my life and that's how i got new ideas and did something new which has added a lot of value to me and enriched me a lot so i am sure you'll agree that every entrepreneur faces a lot of roadblocks setbacks in their own journey i have had multiple setbacks also in the initial days when i started working our office was located in the heart of commodity markets masjid bandar very crowded area lot of hand carts lorries warehouses very difficult to get into the office no parking place and as we started recruiting talent we started calling people to our office for interviews and most of the time before entering the office the potential candidate who was called he would just run away so i had to overcome that negative so i started calling them to the wellington club meet them once twice sell them the story and then later them later on bring them to the office in the initial years i was not able to attract good talent so i had to identify individual consultants in in functional areas like marketing hr and work with them uh, best in class consultants i remember i was working with a professor in indian institute of management ahmedabad uh, very bright uh, marketing mind but he made a condition that if you want to be consulting with me i only have time in the night so i used to go take an evening flight to ahmedabad spend the whole night discussing with him and come back the next morning so what i'm trying to say is that i think it's very important to have that burning desire to succeed if you have the desire to succeed you'll overcome all the issues in life and when i am recruiting any person the first thing i see in that person is that how strong is that burning desire to succeed because if you have that inner drive within you you will overcome all your negatives all your setbacks so they say passion is very important for any entrepreneur i agree passion is very important but if you are just passionate and if you don't have that determination and perseverance you may just leave something half way the right word for this is grit which is a combination of passion combined with perseverance and determination and i think that's what my second mantra is that you have to build your grit and not just passion in my own journey i've had multiple failures and i think it's but natural for any person to fail but that should not deter you you know you have to take risks in life and remove the fear of failure in the initial days i there was nobody to guide me in the business and i took a lot of shortcuts in the area of quality assurance i launched a new product and it had huge quality problems and that led me to establishing a quality assurance function i took some shortcuts in the legal area we had to take some licenses for operating some warehouses and we got caught and two three of my colleagues were it was just a small error of not applying for a license but in those days the punishment was you had to, the police arrested them and that just shook me up and i i went overboard in terms of the legal compliances as we moved forward i started having issues and especially in in fmcg the success rate is about 1 or 2 out of 10 globally and you have to take risks in that in terms of new product launches there is a lot of limitation to market research and i strongly believe that all the answers ultimately come from the marketplace so a few years back under the brand name safola we launched we identified bake snacks as as an opportunity area and at that time all the snacks were fried snacks and we thought that 
with overall health awareness increasing, we would have a very good winner on hands. Now what happened was the team, the, the team who was handling the brand Safola, uh, and Safola stands for good health, good for heart, they went overboard on heart and health. And they gave priority to heart, which is very healthy product, but not so much on taste. And in a snacks category, which is a very impulsive category, taste is the most important. So the consumers just rejected the product, though it was very healthy, because it was not that tasty. And I think out of that failure, there was a big learning for us. When we launched recently, about two years back, we identified oats as a way to grow. And we said that can we launch a range of masala oats, which is based on Indian need for having savory breakfast. So we launched a range of masala oats. We were the pioneers in that. And we went overboard on taste. Not only in India, different taste profile exists for different parts of India. So for each region, we have a different type of masala oats, different flavors. And that learning has really helped us. It has been a big, big success. We have a 70, 75% market share in the, big, in the masala oats category. And the category from zero base has grown to almost 100 crores in the last two, three years. So what I'm saying is that please remove your fear of failure. Failure is but natural. Sometimes you win and sometimes you learn and not fail. Um, I think it's important to take risks and fail and learn from them. In the earlier days, my next mantra is always to have win-win negotiations. In my earlier days, I was also handling the factories and labor negotiations. And that time, our union leader was Dr. Datta Samant. I'm sure many of you heard of him. Very militant. And I used to negotiate with him our settlements. And being young, I always wanted to win. So there was a strike about in our factory. And after three or four months of strike, the laborers started getting impatient. And I said, I want to teach them a lesson. And I, I will give them a raw deal because they've gone on strike. So we negotiated a settlement which was very much in our favor. It was actually win-lose kind of settlement. Two years later, it backfired on us. Again, they went back on strike because they felt cheated. Again, a three-month strike. And that's how I learned my lesson that you cannot have a win-lose negotiation. You have to have a win-win. They also have to come winning out. And I think that's the fourth lesson I have. The next one I want to share is that each of us has a God-given gift. God has given us some gifts and each person has a different set of gifts. Many of us don't realize what is our God-given gift. And I would urge each of you to identify your God-given gift. Many of us may have a blind spot that this is a gift I have. I would urge that you get hold of your, your family, your friends who know you well and ask them how do they perceive you, what is my God-given gift. And normally we tend to look at improving on our weaknesses, not leverage our strengths. My mantra is that 75% of your effort should go to improving your strengths and 25% in terms of nullifying your weaknesses. In terms of your career also or the business you're doing, ideally speaking, it should be leveraging your strengths. For example, I, I'm very low on technology and I would never have been able to manage a business which was high on tech. And that's why I chose a business which was low on technology, which was high on consumer insights, high on people, high on processes, high on opportunity seeking uh, behavior as far as consumer is concerned. I think that's worked in our favor. And so my next mantra is that, okay, play to your strengths and concentrate more your strengths rather than on your weaknesses. If I look back at my role over a period of time, it has changed multiple times. And I think it's, it'll happen to each of us. When I started off of business, it was my startup base. And I, I used to do things. Uh, very short-term oriented, I was managing skill gaps, ambiguity, my business model was evolving, I had to put in much more hard work, I was going through a learning curve, and there was a bit of uncertainty about future. 
and I was actually doing things, including actually briefing advertising agencies and things like that. But as the business grew, we had to start recruiting people. And that's where my role changed from doing things to getting things done. And for many entrepreneurs, this is a big, big challenge, you know. How do I delegate? How do I recruit talent? Um, how do I create the right organization structure? Uh, what kind of systems do I need? How do I ensure team building? Uh, how do I create the right culture in the organization? So the role shifts from doing things to getting things done through others. And as the business grows further, and this has happened, this is what happened when we went public, your role changes again. You know, your role is then influencing others. So you are in charge of meeting external investors, uh, managing the board, investor relations, quarterly pressures, macro issues, dealing with the government issues, succession planning and things like that. So I think every entrepreneur should realize that they have to reinvent themselves on a perpetual basis. You cannot just say that what I was doing when I started business will be relevant as I grow. And if you don't change, then the business may just not grow. I have given up my role as managing director about three years back. And my role is, again, very, very different, you know. So every change in this big change in this role has provided me a lot of learning. And I have personally enriched myself. And when you delegate, you don't abdicate. You're ultimately accountable for what you're doing. For example, what I'm doing today is I'm ad adding value to Mary Kukaya. My hands are off. My mind is always on in terms of how do I improve the performance of the company. So I would say that not every year, but every few years, you need to ask questions. How do I reinvent myself? I hear from entrepreneurs that they are always trapped for time. I don't have time to do, I don't have time to do this. I would say that lack of time is an effect. On a perpetual basis, you can't say, I have, don't have time. Then there is something wrong in terms of what you're doing. I'm a big believer in focus. Do a few things, but do them well. Uh, so select and prioritize your things you're doing. In terms of your own team, select talent which is better than you so that you can, you're forced to delegate to them. You create the right culture which is trustworthy, open, um, so that everybody in the organization is able to function on their own. I tend to prioritize a lot in terms of my day, in terms of my month, in terms of the year. And I have a yearly schedule of all my meetings which are fixed at the beginning of the year. So if you plan your time well, and if you delegate, I don't think lack of time will happen. At least I've never had this issue where I felt that I don't have time to do things, what I wanted to do. The other thing which I hear from entrepreneurs is I, I'm very stressed. Some amount of stress is important. They call it positive stress. It motivates you. But when it re crosses that border of positive stress and becomes negative, then it starts having an impact on your health, on the business. So how do you overcome stress and how do I overcome stress? I think the most important thing is to, first of all, do things in the right way, ethically, be fair to others, don't cut corners when it comes to compliances, be very transparent, be very honest, and that itself will reduce a lot of unnecessary stress, stress which is arising because you've done something wrong. The other is actually go on de-risking yourself. Many a times stress comes in because you've taken some risk which has not done well, it has led to a failure. And what I try to do is to prototype that risk, de-risk it by doing it on a small scale. For example, if you have to launch a new product, what we would do is we would launch it in one city or one chain of stores and try that prototyping and then learn from that. So your overall stakes are much lower in terms of risk. So even if you fail, uh, it's a learning and it doesn't put you back. Uh, in spite of that, there will be some stress. So I compartmentalize my time. Um, and my stress buster after I finish the day is going to the gym. 
for each of us, we just need to determine what is our stress buster. It could be music, it could be walk, it could be spending time with the family. But for me, it's working out of the gym and just tiring myself out so that I can have a, a good sleep in the night. So I think dealing with stress is very important for entrepreneurs. And finally, the last point I wanted to make was, I think beyond a threshold level, most entrepreneurs are not driven by a monetary vision. They want to make an impact give back something to the society. In the initial days, money is important, but as you grow the business, money is not a motivator. I think somewhere along the line, recognition starts taking place instead of money. A uh, challenge starts taking place, but beyond a point, once you achieved certain goal, even recognition challenge loses relevance. And at that time, you need to ask, what is the purpose? What is the purpose? Why am I born in this world? And our purpose evolves as we grow through the phases. Uh, purpose grows and develops with us. My purpose is to make a difference to others. And whatever I am doing, whether it's ascent or whether it is uh, helping mentally uh, challenge people um, or our innovation foundation, I think the whole objective is to make a difference to others. And I think that's what drives me today. Let me end by saying that the purpose of life is not to be happy. It is to be useful, it is to be compassionate, and to make some difference that you have lived well and impacted others. Thank you very much.